Review lecture three, financial cycles, bubbles, conjuncture, bricolage. So one of our assertions, my assertions, is that a financialized economy will, con will, will create conjunctural asset bubbles. So what we need to know that is what do I mean by conjuncture? And conjuncture is just the bringing together of unique factors in time and space that, cr that creates an opportunity. But it's an opportunity that is not immediately, we're not immediately aware of that opportunity. Okay, it's therefore the consequence of the conjuncture creates um, or prov provides space for uh, investors and others to use whatever kind of like investment tools we've got lying around in order to be able to maximize their own opportunities of the conjuncture. And that, that sort of like rolls on. So, and, and I'll explain how that rolls on through the securitization of mortgages, you know, it's collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, and so on and so forth. And that's what we refer to as bricolage, to be seen as being part of the same thing, part of the same phenomenon. But it's the, that conjuncture, what's going on at the time, that creates the space for bricolage to go on, which creates asset bubbles. And the asset bubbles, need to be understood in the context of Minsky's theory or Minsky's view of finance. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that towards the end. So in order to demonstrate this notion of conjuncture is that I've, listened, I've listed some asset bubbles there. Um, and um, bubbles, asset bubbles, and not always crisis, but bubbles and bubbles popping have been created out of every one of these particular these scenarios um, and the junk bonds one of the 1980s if you look at the conjuncture of that is that one is that um, investors believe that money can be made out of investing in junk bonds um, as a consequence of the black skulls merton formula which determines the rate of the junk bonds if you use them, if you package them up in a particular kind of derivative. But in essence, what it's saying is that um, using the Black Skulls Merton formula makes these things more predictable, is that you can calculate future yields. And as a consequence, people invested in junk bonds, package them all up, and the returns on junk bonds behaved in a way that was totally in accord with the Black Skulls Merton formula, which seems to suggest that the formula was actually predicting what the returns were going to be but then all of a sudden it stopped doing it and the returns um, widely diverged to the point where a lot of the investment starts to fail now there's a question here then as to whether or not the black skulls merton formula is predicting the grades uh, predict it, predicting the returns or whether it's actually making the market i.e investors by their mere expectations that the yields would um, perform in a particular way is that they make the market okay and we've talked about narratives and how narratives can perform the market make the market happen and this is a good example of it is that the black skulls formula is the narrative you need to think about narratives in their wider senses okay but in essence there's the story of the black skulls merton formula is that if you do all these things and you make this calculation that this is the return and that was the expectation for the wide part of the market and so people were working towards the expectations of that market the, the, the narrative has performed the market okay and so black skulls merton formula creates the conjuncture around which investors then start to operate and there are others and i've listed them there we're going to spend some time talking about real estate bubbles today, and then I'll talk more about quantitative easing next week. So if we think about the first financial crisis, um, first recorded financial crisis, which was in Holland in the 17th century, which occurred when there was widespread speculation and investment in an asset class, which actually just turned out to be tulips. It turned out to be a flower. But again, you have to understand and appreciate the conjuncture because from our sense is that why on earth would people invest money, a lot of money in 
um, um, in, a, in a flower, in a flower class. From our perspective, it looks rather bizarre. But let's flip the coin or flip this scenario a little bit and think about investors in the 17th century looking at our conjuncture and investing in, say, something like a Bitcoin. Now, both would look equally bizarre because back in the 17th century is that money was synonymous with gold and that had value and was seen in that particular light, whereas now money has been created in the cyberverse. But that's not untypical because of the fact that our own money, which is mostly credit, is also created in exactly the same sort of way. So it's very sometimes very difficult to, to look at different conjunctures and appreciate them for what they are, which is why we say that it's important that we do need to take the time out to step back and look at them objectively. So in 17th century Holland, Holland is standing on the cusp of its own empire. It is the predominant, the predominant power on the planet. It is the large merchant, merchant um, sea force. They are the big, biggest trading nation on the planet. And as a consequence of that is there's quite a lot of money and wealth sloshing around in 17th century Holland. So you create a new middle class, a very affluent middle class and an affluent middle class that is looking for places in which to invest its money. The notion of investment is not, a, is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but with its empire comes new opportunities. And one of the new imported products, along with spices and so on and so forth, that come from its own empire and from its trading links was the tulip. So to that extent, it's the, it's the, 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 the it's the new phenomenon, the new good that everybody wants. So in that light, when you think about the conjuncture, is that there are people with the demand and the money in order to be able to focus upon purchasing of a new asset class, in this case, tulips. And, you know, the, um, the bubble was very short lived, it was very extremely violent, but as you hear the narratives concerning investments and where to make money, we shouldn't be surprised that people make the market, they perform the market. And so as a consequence of that is that investment into tulips drives up the price of tulips. And as a consequence of that is that once the narrative changes, is that the asset class drops down on the other side and starts to depreciate very, very quickly. And in those scenarios, is that if you're holding tulips as an asset, you want to get rid of them quite quick because the price is going down. Because if you don't, you're going to lose more money. And so, again, what this is doing is this is illustrating how a conjuncture can be exploited by the bricklayer. Now, we have not talked about the bricklayer in this particular element because of the fact that there's not a huge amount that's known about it. But what is known is that people did enter into quite considerable amounts of debt in order to be able to finance the purchase of the asset class. So I've given you a story of a bubble, but what's interesting, interesting is that in 2014, the Bank of International Settlements, which is the regulator of the central banks, albeit it's a voluntary regulator of the central banks, but nevertheless, there's lots of industries that are done by voluntary regulators. But in 2014, they issued this particular statement in their report, where they admit the existence of financial cycles. Now, why is this revelatory? Well, it is because for the most part, and certainly since the 1980s, is that the academics, theoreticians, and so on and so forth have been looking at markets to say that they are efficient, they self-correct. Well, within that scenario, you can't get a financial cycle. You don't get bubbles because the, mar the market is starting to behave erratically, irrationally. So this is quite a big thing is that this admissions, the admittance that financial cycles occur. Now, you could say that financial cycles pop away as a self-correction, but they're not, they're self-correcting very, very violently at that particular point. They're not, they're not self-correcting in time. Um, 
So their article says that financial cycles differ from business cycles. They encapsulate the self-reinforcing interaction. What is exactly a self-reinforcing interaction? Self-reinforcing is something we, whereby we, it, whatever we hold is reinforced by interactions. Well, that can only really be narratives. So what they're suggesting is that self-reinforcing interactions between perceptions of value and risk are established through people, through the, the various narratives that occur within the trading cycle, within the market itself. So narratives that we tell each other, including all of the calculations, because I've, you know, I've looked at um, Black Skulls Merton, Black Skulls Merton, but also just consider something which is quite humdrum, like a variance at risk calculation is that that is an acceptance that we can control the risk, we can manage the risk, which is all fair and dandy if what you've done is that you've seen that particular scenario before. And so probability is the risk of something occurring, but you can only calculate that probability, that risk, if you've seen it before. And Keynes's argument, and the argument that I'm making here now, is that the future is uncertain. It's very difficult to be able to calculate it because the future is uncertain. You've not seen it before. Therefore, the risk is unknown. But part of the narrative is that we can control the risk. We can calculate the risk, our exposure based upon risk, variance at risk calculation. So all of these things combine together in order to self-reinforce our own perceptions of what's valuable and what the risk is tend to be longer than business cycles, best measured by a combination of credit aggregates, credit aggregates and property prices. That's important, hint, hint, remember that one. And the interaction between debt and asset prices and output that explains many advanced economies' poor growth in recent years. And that's the topic for next session next Thursday. And this is what they look like. Okay, the red one is the business cycle and the blue one is the financial cycle and all you need to know from this one is that the, 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 the financial cycle is much larger than the business cycle and that the business cycle is flattening out whereas the business the financial cycle is becoming more volatile and the amplitude of the curves are growing particularly since the 1980s now that's completely within our own analysis when we looked at financialization and that the size of financial markets are surpassing the size of productive markets. There are, you know, when we looked at the various asset classes, it's at least three, three and a half times the size of productive capacity. But then when you added in the derivatives, which are based upon other financial assets, is vastly, vastly, vastly larger. But derivatives, the demand for derivatives needs that, requires that we are providing the derivative market with the underlying assets from which the derivatives can be derived. So that's, that's part of the conjuncture. If there's no market for the derivatives, then there'll be less of a demand for the underlying assets in the first place. So financial cycles and business cycles, and they act independently according to this particular graph but as you can see on there that there are bars the gray bars gray columns which indicate recessions and it isn't until we look at Minsky's understandings of finance and financial cycles that the recessions and the recessionary periods have particular pertinence so we'll come back to that so Let's try and unpack together now the actual conjuncture that occurs at the time of the global financial crisis in the after the turn of the millennium leading up to the crisis and the closing of layman's in 2007. So in order to understand the growth of the derivatives market when, and the rise of the securitizer and the rise of securitization, we need to look at how banks reinvented themselves. The old business model is that investment banks provide corporate services, mergers and acquisitions, issuation, uh, mergers and acquisitions advice, and new issues. So they would underwrite things and help with IPOs and that sort of thing. So in effect, that they are financial intermediaries. Now we've heard this expression before, haven't we, with commercial banks, where commercial banks 
take loans and lend them on to other people and just charge interest rate splits is how they would make the money apart from the fact that they originate credit. So actually it's a completely different business model to the model that's actually been set out in textbooks. Now in this one is that there's very little controversy about the change in investment banking is that whilst investment banks started initially operated on the behalf of clients as intermediaries, is that they started to work out that they could trade on their own behalf to be, in order to be able to make more money. So they became their own client in many respects. And then the new business model, investment banks act as financial engineers and proprietary traders on their own account in the wholesale market with added leverage. Now that's important is because what they would do is that rather than trade on their existing assets that they hold is that they would borrow huge amounts of money in order to leverage their trades okay so the the, the estimates are is that somewhere a reason of about 40 to 1 so instead of investing a million dollars in a particular proprietary trade we would be investing 40 million dollars which would make the profits much higher but the real significant point is this shift from intermediary trading to proprietary trading where you're acting in your own self-interests. Remembering narratives make markets, they perform the markets. So in this instance, investment banks, and particularly by leveraging their trades, have got the capacity now to be able to make markets, to perform the market. Because when one, in, uh, one rather like the tulips, is that if somebody is seen to be making um, excessive amounts of money, what's likely to happen? What are the other people in the, in the industry likely to do? Well, they're likely to follow. And then like, so, so you know, I, I gave the analogy of, of watching traders uh, Friday in, in Leadenhall market is they're all talking about how they've made money and then would go and repeat the trades that their colleagues had made in other banks. You know, so if some, if bank A is making a lot of money out of mortgage backed securities, what's the chances that bank B will say, well, should we do this? And follow the market but in doing so they're making the market happen narratives performativities it's got much more explanatory power than saying well market self-correct or efficient and everybody's got perfect information as i've said before if we've all got perfect information there would be no requirement for a university at, at, along with other aspects of it and clearly perfect information as an axiom doesn't represent the real. What this is doing, the narrative performativity stance is looking at the real and, and, and asking how do these things occur? And there's a book that I've given you on your reading lists by Schiller, Joseph Schiller called Narrative Economics. And I think that his chapter on Bitcoin is um, interesting. I don't think he goes the whole way that perhaps thrift and Gay have gone and really understanding cultural economy, but nevertheless, the Bitcoin chapter is a nice historiographical account of how the value in Bitcoins grew to the extent that they that they did. So you've got this shift in the or a reinvestment of investment banking. New conglomerates like Deutsche Bank, Barclays, and Citibanks are engaging in mass marketing and proprietary trading. Now, the mass marketing comes from the commercial end of the bank; is that they're selling. Um, they're, they're, they're selling financial products to the likes of you and I, student debts, credit cards, mortgages, insurances and pensions. And they're using those, or a different part of the banking conglomerate is using those in order to establish their own proprietary trading. So one arm of the business is selling financial products. The other arm of the same company is therefore establishing them trading those for their own gain. So you can see that there's a demand for them that's established by their own business. We want more derivative trades because they're very profitable. So we need the underlying assets. You're the mass marketers. Go out and sell more of these things in a virtual circle. And everybody makes money. So therefore, we need to understand this notion of securitization. And it is linked to the originate to distribute banking model, which is the idea about... In the olden 
more traditional banking circles is that banks would originate, say, a mortgage and it would hold it on its own balance sheet until it matured and so on and so forth. And its gains it would make would be after the interest payments. Well, if it does that, it clogs up its own balance sheet and perhaps it might want to free up its balance sheet in order to be able to continue to lend. And so what it would do, therefore, is instead of holding the mortgage, it would sell that mortgage onto a third party and the third party would pay it. But nevertheless, it would still manage the interest rate payments for the mortgage and pass that money on to the new purchaser, but it would charge the new purchaser a fee. So it would make money out of security. And that is in effect securitizing. So it's based on this originate and distribute rather than the originate and hold model. So we can raise funds therefore from outside investors through bond issuances, which re releases liquidity and reduces risk. In effect, what we're doing is that we are trading our, or we are leveraging our trades in order to buy up more of these particular assets or originate these assets, and therefore we can sell them on. Okay, and the way that we would sell them on, these mortgages would sell them on as effectively as a security that behaves like a bond. So in effect, a security is any kind of asset that can be traded um, without losing any value. Okay, so it has a price that's on it. And a bond returns an interest rate, a coupon rate. So these securities behave, a bond is a security as well. So these securities that they are originating behave like bonds. So the issuance of marketable securities backed by cash flows from specific assets sit underneath and underpin these things. So what in effect all this means is that, is that somebody borrows, lots of people borrow money for mortgages. So we will package those mortgages up. Um, buy, sorry, some the, 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 the person who wants the loan buys up the mortgages. So in doing that, there's a contract between them and whoever originates that loan. They would then package up those contracts, sell those contracts to a third party, out of which the third party are the investors that are in it. Okay, so they're buying that bond and they're getting a return on their investment, which is a fee that, that gets every month, which is financed by the, by the interest payments by the people who took the, the loans out in the first place. So you've got obligers, which are the loan customers, people have bought mortgages. You've then got the originators, whoever sold the mortgages in the first place. And then you've got investors, the third party, the people that are over here that are buying them. Now, the, the, the innovation and part of this bricolage story is that banks used off balance sheet vehicles in order to buy the assets in the first place. And then by doing that is that in effect is that the banks were able to lend the SPV the money in order to be able to buy the, the, the mortgages and then package them up and sell them on into the market. So there was, they created a firm off their own balance sheet. So it was very difficult to know exactly the volumes that were being traded in here. So why did they do that? Well, because it, if they didn't, then all of these new investments and all of these debts would appear on their own balance sheets. So you can put them over there and make your own balance sheet look better than perhaps it might do because of the <clears throat> amount of investments or the debt that's been taken on in order to be able to originate these mortgages and then pass them on to somebody else. So it's just a convenient accounting exercise, really. And also the credit rating agencies are part and parcel of the stories because they rate the securities before they get sold on to investors. So unsurprisingly, therefore, you get a huge growth in securitization and especially linked to the growth of the mortgage markets. Now, I'm going to stop at that point and ask you if you've got any questions that's related to securitization as we talked about it here. Are we all good? Great. So let's just get our heads around the flow one last time. A bank originates mortgages, loan customers buy the mortgages. The bank therefore has a, uh, is, is the, that's a commercial bank, which may also be linked to its investment arm. 
The investment arm creates a special purpose vehicle to bridge the gap between the two, if you like, and is loaned money. The SPV buys up the mortgages, contracts from the originator, and then sells them onto a third party. Okay. Now the flows of money go through and to the investments, and every time that they somebody touches it, they'll charge them a fee. And that, in effect, is securitization. I say they've made it secure because what they've done is they've passed the risk on to somebody else. And this just shows you the value, the volume of securitized issues from 96 to 2006. And you can see that by 96, you're looking at 685 billion in the US. But by 2006, it's over 3 trillion. OK. Um, but the pattern's replicated elsewhere. Okay. It's not just a US issue. This was a not a global issue. That would be unfair. But certainly this would be an advanced economy, those economies that were heavily financialized issue. And so that leads us to the derivatives end of it. <clears throat> a derivative is a contract that derives its value from some other market or asset. It's got to be tied to a reference asset or an income flow. Okay. you can create derivatives off indexes of shares which are just tied to the return of the share or the return of the index return of the market and insurance is a contract that provides financial restitution when a loss making event occurs so the derivative if they are futures act in a little bit like a way like insurances but in effect, what we could do, what the market did do, was to actually apply an insurance contract to the derivative contract in a way to make them even more, um, more secure. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So the key claim here is that derivatives combined with the useful in risk management, they can calculate uncertainty. But they're also highly profitable because they can be used speculatively. And if you've got high returns, then they will attract more speculation. Derivatives can be bold, uh, bought and sold on as equities, um, debt, currencies and commodities. And they're even sold on some quite abstract notions such as volatility. So providing that there is an income stream, which will be the underlying asset, is that you can create and trade a derivative. And that will be one of the reasons why there's 1.4 quadrillion dollars of them existing on the planet at any one particular point in time. Huge business, big business. And we don't know for definite how many are there because they are traded by contracts between two parties. They're not traded on any exchange. So you don't know how many contracts are in existence. And we can only but guess. So one of the derivatives that was party in the or was significant in the global financial crisis was this one cdos or collateral collateralized debt obligations and and they're created because a there's a demand for derivative products there's increasing demand for securitization mortgages but not everybody is interested in buying the security at that level of interest. People have got different rates of risk preference and they've got higher return expectations. Since they're just contracts between two parties, does it mean that potentially anyone can create a derivative? Yeah, anyone can potentially. However, they're legal contracts and you'd need quite a considerable amount of money sitting behind you in order to be able to create a significant derivative contract. But if you wanted to, to say you wanted to borrow some money now and you were prepared to pay it back to somebody in five years time, but you were going to fix the price on what you'd pay back as an option, that will be a derivative contract. Okay. So how do you tailor your, security, your securities with clear risk returns to those with di uh, diverse investors. How do you package something up, a security that can appeal to a wider array of investors? 
you slice and dice it therefore you tranche it in order to meet market demand investor demand and then you can apply a cds a credit default swap contract to the senior tranche the least risky tranche which guarantees the AAA rating Mortgage issuer lends money to a number of would-be homeowners or home movers. The issuer sells the pool of mortgage contracts to a bank. The bank builds an even larger pool from a range of other mortgage issuers and sells that pool onto its, its own special interest or special purpose vehicle. The, S, the SPV, the special purpose vehicle, slices and dices the mortgages into tranches with launches which command higher returns, but also loss exposure, okay? So what does that mean and what does that look like? Well, that's the graph, okay? Is that the company, XY company, is buying up all of these mortgages, passing them to its, its special purpose vehicle, the SPV, and the, SP, the SPV is, is tranching the security in order to appeal to various classes, okay? Or, or higher um, people with different risk preference. So class A, which is the more secure tranche, would probably have been about 95% of total contracts sold. Class B, 2%, class C, 3%, and so on and so forth. So the top ones and the more appealing ones, but those that want higher levels of risk could also enter into the market as well. And I've said that this is analogous to the Champagne Tower, in that all of these are contracts, mortgage contracts that are wrapped up in a particular collateralized debt obligation, they're all funded by the champagne or money that comes in at the top of the tower. And then we can tranche them out by selling out the ones that are the most secure ones at a lower yield, but they're the ones that we're gonna get paid first. So they're the secure, and that will be 95% of all contracts. And as you go further down the tower, it becomes more and more risky. Any money that sloshes into the bottom of it onto the table, We'd keep that. That's what's known as the mezzanine tranche, and we'd keep that, or the bank that originated the CDO would keep that as its own profits. Okay, so those that are on the bottom, not the mezzanine, the one above it, the 8% one, is that they might not be expecting to get paid every month, but when they do get paid, they're very happy. Okay, so by slice and dicing it, is you increase the market appeal, but also you increase the Overall, overall validity of the CDO because 95% of your clients are going to be get, making money at that top end tranche. Okay, so slicing and dicing. Mark, let's go back. Mortgage origination, packaging up a mortgage contract into a security, selling them off by a special purpose vehicle to investors and slicing them so that they appeal to different investors in the market. And as a consequence of that, is that they have huge appeal amongst investors because they look incredibly secure. They're AAA rated, which is higher than the risk rating of the American government, okay? It's almost like a license to print money in some respects, isn't it? Well, let me take some time out here again and ask you if you've got any questions about this particular notion or the, this, this generation of CDOs at this stage. So you can see the bricolage. We've looked at the conjuncture and we've now moved into the, how the investment banks would use the conjuncture in order to create more more, more opportunities for themselves. And they've innovated within the market using existing tools. The existing tool is the mortgage and the mortgage-backed security. They're not new. What is new is the next stages. Conjuncture, bricolage. So while I was talking, has anybody got any questions about this or are we all good with this now? We've, we've cracked it, have we? What happens on the uh, mezzanine like level well the mezzanine level is any champagne that actually hits on uh, lands on the table so remembering is that the special purpose vehicle has issued these collateralized debt obligations and is collecting the money and paying them on to the investors well any any champagne money that goes onto the table is that the special purpose vehicle would keep that thanks 
additional profitability. Does that, does that explain your question? Was it Cameron that asked that? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. So I use this because I think this is interesting, is that November 2008, after the financial crisis, the Queen asked at London School of Economics, why did nobody see it coming? Why did you not notice it? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the reason that nobody noticed it is because people weren't looking for it. Is that markets were very stable, property prices were going up, people are all making money. Gordon Brown said, we've conquered boom and bust. So you get this huge period of stability. There's what's known as the great moderation before the great financial crisis and then followed by the great recession. But the point that I'm wanting to make here is that if you're not looking for financial bubbles because your models tell you that markets tend towards equilibrium and stability is that you're not looking for any inherent stability in the market. The markets are therefore behaving as they ought to do. So the, the, the very worst, and I think it was Krugman actually, but I might be being a bit disingenuous to Krugman, but Krugman suggested that, well, there might be some price overheating in the, in the property markets, but you, know, you, you might see a, a small price correction, but nothing significant. But if people had been looking at different data sets, i.e. financial cycles, they may well have had an awareness that perhaps it's not just the asset class that's overheating, is that there's something significant happening in the market. Particularly when you start to look at levels of debt and private debt that's been occurring, private debt being distinguished from public debt, private debt is household, households and firms. Okay. When you start to look at levels of private debt, as you can see that that was growing and it might ask you to raise some questions about what was going on in the market. But you'd need to have a framework to be able to understand the possibilities of bubbles and bubble collapses and crises. And so that draws my draws our attention, therefore, towards Minsky's thesis is instability hypothesis. Part of the explanation for the financial crisis financial crisis is that there was a shock to the market that occurred outside of the system and questions therefore need to be raised about well what's the point of your model of economy when something outside of your model of economy can affect the economy so badly perhaps there needs to be a model of economy that incorporates these shocks or potentialities of shocks bearing in mind is that the shock that they're talking about is really money because the underlying axiom of economics and money is that money is neutral. It doesn't have any impact upon the economy. <clears throat> so Minsky suggested that you really needed a model of economy within which recessions or depressions was a normal state of affairs, i.e. they can happen again. So his theory is based upon the, his theoretical antecedents of Marx, Schumpeter, Fisher and Keynes, all of which are disequilibrium economists that suggest that markets don't tend towards equilibrium. And if they do arrive at equilibrium, it's almost by accident. For the most part, they're in a disequilibrium. And Minsky started his analysis looking at the Great Depression and asked the question, could it happen again? And also, why hasn't it happened since? And of course, Minsky died before the global financial crisis, but it did happen again. It happened in the global financial crisis. So it requires a theory within which depression is just one possible state of the economy. OK, it's not a shock from outside of the system. The shock from outside of a system which is um, a system which self-corrects and moves towards equilibrium is not seeable. OK, it's 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 one that doesn't need any explanation. It's it's an expression of um, it's a black swan event. We couldn't know about it. Now, you know what I mean by black swans? Possibly not, actually. But black swans is a philosophical sort of like concept in that philosophers looking at empirical reality would say that all swans are white well that would depend upon which part of the world that you were in if you're in the uk then all swans are white 
and you've proved that axiom correct by observation until perhaps you travel to Australia where they do have black swans. And that's why it's known as a black swan event. Okay. But a black swan event is one that can't be, couldn't have been foretold. Okay. And the, the, I mean, he's not the generator of the, um, of the, the originator of the, the concept, the black swan, but Nicholas Talib, who wrote the book, Black Swans, said that the financial crisis wasn't a black swan it was clearly observably possible if you'd have been looking at the right set of data. So we need a theory in which depression is just one possible state of the economy. And within his model, Mil Minsky builds in money, rather significantly, I think, Cycli cyc cyclicality, things go around in cycles, and it's embeddedable in, embedded in time which means that the future is uncertain, it's unknowable, and has different parties into it as opposed to just producers and consumers. It's got workers, banks, capitalists, and governments in his model. And Minsky's model is descriptive, okay? And it explains the crises of 1930s and it also explains the big financial crisis which is in the 1850s in 1850s 1870s I forget which one there was two but there's one which is known as a financial panic and I think it's 1850s but it explains that data set too and he didn't live to see the global financial crisis of 2006-7 but it explains what's going on there as well and the stages of his cycle are that in the beginning, the economy's doing well, but firms are very conservative because you can still remember the previous, cri previous crisis. So estimates of future cash flows are low. And as a consequence of that is our investments tend to be low as well. Banks additionally are very conservative as well. And they're not really winning, willing to low. They want to be want to sort of like a bit more surety that they're going to actually get their money back. So as people, start to invest with lower investment windows or expectations there's a fair chance that these things will succeed and as a consequence as they see people become more confident debt's easily covered it pays to borrow so as a consequence people start to become less risk averse more confident investments in and the price levels of the assets start to raise start to go up because our investments are successful and this is what Minsky refers to as the euphoric economy. Increased interest rates puts um, highly leveraged firms uh, at increased levels of risk. So what we're now doing is that starting from the conservative phase where returns are quite low, expectations are low and banks are happy to lend is that that gains confidence. And so we push the windows because oh, we can make some more money. So it pays to borrow. But actually now what we can do is that we can borrow more money and expect a higher level of return because the economies are growing. So as we do this, the euphoria grows and people will push the investment yields and expectations much, much higher. And they will start to leverage their trades, borrow money to invest in other um, borrow money in order to be able to invest in future returns and use that money to pay back the debts that they've incurred, which means that you're, getting, you're building higher levels of risk into the, into the economy as well. And then latterly, you get the Ponzi financier. So they're trading their assets on a rising market by borrowing, but the cost of the debt is higher than the cash flow that's being originated out of the investments in the debts, uh, the investment class in the first place. So people are borrowing money to trade in mortgages and then are paying the debts back by the gains that they're making out of the mortgages, the properties. And once the actual cost of the loans are higher than the, re the, the money that's been made on the mortgage, uh, on the underlying asset, in this case, the mortgages, the properties, is that now you've got the, what's known as Ponzi financing. And that will only occur once we go through the euphoric state and people get very confident about gains that can be made. Is Ponzi financing and leverage the same thing? No. Um, leveraging is just the act of, of, of trading up, of borrowing money to actually enhance your trades. 
So if I'm going to trade and I've got a million dollars, then I would borrow somebody else's money in order to so that I can invest more money. So in this instance, where we're looking at the Ponzi financing, is that people are borrowing money in order to be able to buy more properties and then are paying back the loans that they've incurred on the property price increases that they've made. Now, once the money that's made back on the properties drops down below the price of the actual loans, okay, so you're using one to pay off the other. And once the returns that you're making on the property is not sufficient in order to be able to pay back the actual loans, then what you've now got is you've got Ponzi financing. Because in effect, what's happening is that you need to buy more properties in order to pay off the existing loans and so on and so on and so forth. And the pricing gets, escalates and gets out of hand. Does that answer your question, Winnie? Good. Um, where did we get to on this one? So enter the Ponzi financing, rising interest rates and debt to equity ratios affect the viability of business um, activities. So we move from the conservative, the speculative or the euphoric and into the Ponzi stage. And that banks find that customers no longer pay their debts because they've borrowed money on the expectations of rising asset classes, which aren't very liquid anyway. And in Minsky's view, the role of government is to upset, offset the worst of the impending crisis. Now, Bretton Woods, as we talked about last time, saw the potentiality of financial crisis and set up a regulatory framework to try and offset crises and did so for a very significant period of time. So Minsky's view, therefore, is that stability is, sta is destabilizing because any form of before any crisis is that what you get is a is a period of stability but that stability itself is building in because of the the speculative and the euphoric nature of investment is that it's building in risk already which as it goes up like tulips will pop once you get that that sort of people starting to either fail to pay off the debts or you get huge price corrections and this is what minsky would argue is the natural state of a financial a financial cycle so if we go back and just look at this one i'm not sure if i can okay so at this stage here is that that's where we've got the conservative stage here you start to get the euphoric stage and at this point is that we've now got the Ponzi stage. Now, what's important here is to note that at this point, financial crisis kicks in. And this is on the downturn of the financial cycle. Remembering from what we talked about in earlier sessions, it's the financial cycle, the issuance of credit that drives the economy. Once the financial cycle issuances of credit slows down, doesn't need to go negative, it's just the growth of credit slows down, is that the underlying economy itself will slow down as well and will tip into a recessionary period. If you think about credit as being a proxy for aggregate demand, is that once credit slows down, aggregate demand slows down. Once aggregate demand slows down, what do firms do? firms take corrective measures, they reduce their costs. What's the primary cost that they will reduce? Labour. And you reduce the levels of labour. Once you reduce the levels of labour, you reduce the levels of aggregate demand, which means that the whole thing falls into a cycle. And eventually is that the economy will tip into a recession, which will negate that government steps in in order to offset the worst parts of that recessionary crisis which has been caused by finance and if you look at this graph here is that you go back at the beginning you've got first oil crisis second oil crisis these are crises that appear in the business cycle but they've been subsequently replaced by crises that are occurring in the financial cycle which are impacting the business cycle and if you remember kane said that Finance is the frost that sits upon the productive economy. Well, our argument is that that 
relationships shifted significantly because of the forces, the, the conjuncture and the bricolage that we've talked about today. And that finance presses down on the productive economy and suppresses it and ultimately can weaken the, the, the productive cycle to the extent where it turns into recession, starts to decline, gets smaller. Okay, Minsky, genius. <laughs>